My name is Chris Brandt, and I'm a yoga teacher. It's been 17 days since my last practice. Uh, um, I was drawn to yoga as most guys are. I was dragged by my girlfriend at the time. And uh, my first yoga class uh, was in there. And, and at the end of class, when they put us into Shavasana, I swear to God, I thought she said siesta mocha. And I'm like, this is awesome. I'm coming all the time. Um, and as the students ready, the teacher will appear and, and found a wonderful teacher who was very adamant that yoga that's not applied to the rest of your life isn't yoga. And in my bio, I even say that I'm a strong believer of the idea that what we do in an hour together in a yoga class really doesn't matter. It's how that one hour affects the other 23. The greatest currency we have is our influence over other people. So how do you use that outside of class? Well, a friend and I started a charity. To his credit, he did all the heavy lifting, hired the lawyer, got the thing registered, hired the graphic designer, got the website built, and then said, okay, your turn. So Music Heals is a Vancouver-based foundation that raises money and awareness for music therapy. That money has gone to seniors, palliative care, kids, AIDS and HIV, bereavement, uh, autism, burn units, rehabilitation, and a whole bunch of other things. And in only our first two years, we've been able to give away a quarter million dollars to music therapy programs across the country. Thank you. So what is music therapy? The definition of it is the use of music and musical elements to bring about uh, physical, emotional, or even spiritual change within the client, which is kind of a dry definition. So it's easier, as we've learned already tonight, to tell stories. Examples of music therapy, there was a music therapist who was working with preemies and this infant wasn't feeding and was malnourished and was going to die. And the music therapist came up with a way of attaching a nipple to music so that whenever the baby would feed, music would play. Guess how long the baby took to figure that out? 10 minutes and it started to feed. In bereavement, Camp Carey, which is up in the film here, they're a society that we um, fund the music therapy program of that deals with young families who've lost a parent. And they were doing uh, music therapy with this one boy who had lost his dad. And they were calling it guitar lessons. It had nothing to do with guitar lessons. The kid's dad played guitar. This was his connection point to his dad. He had no way to self-express and had lost all of his confidence. So the music was helping him to get the emotions out and also kind of make him cool give them something to, to do to go to class with. And they called it guitar lessons. In the burn unit, they have these horrible things called burn baths. People who are severely burned, every three days or so, they change all the bandages. And you bring a music therapist in who helps raise the pain threshold so they can do more things by giving them something to focus on. They've actually found with music therapy that clients are using less morphine, less psychoactive drugs in seniors' homes. Uh, Gemma, who was up on the screen here, talked about uh, entrainment. She didn't use the word entrainment, but she's talking about song. And we see this in yoga class. As a yoga teacher, our job is to be the dominant energy in the room, to control the energy of the class. And entrainment, for those who don't know it, is essentially smaller energies deferring to larger energies. If you were to take a room full of small clocks and roll in a grandfather clock in time, they would all sync up. So entrainment in music therapy is fascinating. You get someone who has high anxiety, and you find their heart rate, and you match their heart rate. And maybe use a Marilyn Manson song. You do something that's the same speed, and you make it loud, and you make it the dominant energy. And then you match it, and then you bring it down, and you move into a Sarah McLachlan song. And that's how they use entrainment to work with that. In palliative care, um, especially palliative care with kids, we fund the music therapy program at Connect Place. And the feedback that we get from the parents, their greatest fear, other than the imminent loss of their child is that they're going to forget the sound of their kid's voice. We fund programs that allow them to do recording with the kids. And when the kids are in there, they're more alive and they're fighting harder than they ever have since their diagnosis. And when they're gone, those become legacy projects. With dementia, people who are forgetting the names of their kids can often remember every lyric of a song from when they're 13. They can rewire the brain. There was a kid, 16 years old, massive concussions from snowboarding, 
and his personality was starting to change. He was becoming violent, and the music therapist at GF Strong brought him in, enticed him to come in using Tupac, and said, okay, we're because you, you have to relate to people, and for the 16-year-old kid, that was the thing. So they put him down in a drum set and said, okay, all I want you to do is match the music. So with your feet, left, right with the music, and then with your hands, left, right with the music. And you can do fills, you can do whatever you want, but I just want you to match the beat, left, right with the feet, and left, right with the hands. So they start the song. We're dealing with hand-eye coordination. Finish the song. Let's do it again. Short-term memory. Come back next week. Do it again. Long-term memory. There is no music center in the brain. We have the speech center. We have the math center, the language center. Music is everywhere. So it allows us to rewire the brain through dementia, through stroke, through uh, concussions. And the story that I like to tell the most is a 71-year-old woman in Vancouver a couple years ago had a stroke on the left side of the brain, which is where speech is located. And so she had lost her ability to talk. And non-music therapists were coming in, working with this woman. She was just sobbing all day. And they said, she's not a candidate for anything. She's, there's nothing we can do for her. Music therapists came in, figured, okay, you're 71 years old. You probably grew up with the Beatles. Let's try Let It Be. Real simple, repetitive chorus. By the third line, the woman was singing. So these are the kind of programs that we do. I teach music business uh, at BCIT. And um, so we take rock and roll marketing techniques and apply it to the charity. Um, not, trying not to be dry with charities. And, tr you know, we're not going to compete with the charities that you've known about since you were three, SBCA and UNICEF and World Vision. We're doing something different. One of the programs that we have is called the iPod Pharmacy. And Carolyn is a supporter of this the last three years uh, for the, uh, the conference. We collect old iPods. We clean them off. We try not to judge your musical tastes. <laughs> Skull Candy gives us brand new headphones. We get iTunes gift cards. And we put them together and we give them to music therapists. Now, giving someone an iPod in and of itself isn't music therapy, but it's a tool for them. It's something for one-on-one -on -one care. It's someone who's sitting on dialysis and just having a crappy day. It's a kid who's afraid to get through the night in the hospital. There's so many ways that it's used, and it's used with dementia and used with Alzheimer's and used with uh, concussions and things like that. So we are collecting iPods this weekend. We do have an iPod Depot in Victoria. So you can also check the website if you're not from Victoria. And there's actually an organization in town who's going to be doing an iPod pharmacy drive for the entire south end of the island starting in February. They're going to run it for two months. So please watch for that. Collect iPods in your yoga classes if you like. That's something where we're not asking people for money. We're not imposing on them. You got it sitting in a drawer. You're listening to music on your phone now. Give us the iPod. So again, I teach music business at BCIT, and, and one, of my, um, one of my, the one rule I have for my students is I tell them that I want to be thanked in a Grammy speech. That's the one goal that I have for all of them. <laughs> Years after they leave me, like, they'll start to work together. I'm like, hey, congratulations on the new album. They're like, yeah, I know. I've got to thank you in the Grammy speech. I'm a big believer in that when the student exceeds the teacher, the teacher is immortal. As a student, find teachers that want you to exceed them because then they're not holding anything back. As a teacher, why would you want, not want your students to do better than you? If you're holding back, I believe you're teaching it from the wrong place. So what are you going to do with this extra time, with these extra things that you're going to do at the 23 hours outside of yoga class? Two blocks from here, there will be people who are homeless who are asking you for money. An hour's drive from here, you will find communities that are impoverished, drug and alcohol, um, lower, lower means, poor communities. A few hours by plane, you will go into communities where not only is the government not protecting the people, the government is exploiting them, and their lives are living in such danger. The privileges that we have, you don't have the luxury to do great things. You have the obligation to do great things. So find what it is that you're passionate about, lend your voice to it, and enjoy your siesta mocha. Thank you.